It's become apparent over the last several years that the United States bishops, the USCCB, receives up to 40% of their budget from the taxpayers, from the United States government. And also, we're going to talk today about the uh, new Green Deal that's going on the Democratic Party and basically the hand in glove relationship between the Democratic Party, the United States of America, and the corruption of the American bishops. And here joining me today is John Zmirak. He has his bachelor's from Yale and a master's in screenwriting and his PhD in English. He's the author and co-author of 12 books, including The Politically Incorrect Guide to Catholicism and The Bad Catholic's Guide to the Seven Deadly Sins. He writes five columns a week at stream.org that are widely read. Dr. John Zmirak, welcome. Thank you. Call me, John. And that was a nice introduction. Yeah, the U.S. Catholic bishops, according to the USCCB, 40 percent of their budget last year was federal money that was paid to them in contracts, mostly to serve immigrants. Think about that. 40 percent of their money is federal. That means 40 percent of their activities must be secular. That so, is indistinguishable. So they can't they're not printing out a catechism or putting in an altar or a tabernacle or a new church. This is no, no, that pure, would be yeah, secular purpose. Forty percent of their activity. Not, not necessarily evil purposes, you know, teaching refugees to speak English, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's it's not exactly a spiritual or a corporal work of mercy. You're not gonna get closer to heaven, you're not going to get saved or get out of purgatory because the use you use federal money that's been collected from taxpayers on pain of imprisonment, and you get paid a nice wage to teach somebody to speak English. That's not, that's not evil, but it's not Christian charity. You don't need to be bishops to do it. In fact, everything the bishops do that is paid for by the government is indistinguishable from any other federal contractor. A Muslim charity could do it. Planned Parenthood could do it. Nothing Catholic Charities does with federal money is Catholic, or it would be unconstitutional. Right. But this inflates the budgets. This keeps hundreds and thousands of employees working. It gives bishops a vast administrative bureaucracy that they, they can lord it over. Um, when I checked Dallas Catholic Charities, 50 percent of their budget went to check, went to salaries. So these are rather bloated organizations. We're not exactly talking about Mother Teresa's nuns with a skeleton crew. We're talking about the post office with a picture of the Pope on the wall. Yeah. Amtrak with a little tiny crucifix in the wall. Right. Now, so, you, you said it's not Christian charity. So some people might say, well, yeah, you're helping people. That's Christian charity. So we might need to backtrack here and talk about Thomas Aquinas and the, dis the distinction uh, of what makes charity and how it has to be a free will yeah, well, yeah, well, okay, so, yeah, so uh, if, if I pay my taxes, do I, does that get me closer to God? Am I going to go to heaven because I, I didn't yeah. do tax avoidance? You're, do, you're doing things? what you're supposed to do. If, 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 if you are going to go to prison and be assaulted and, and rot in a cell and maybe worse, uh, and the, in order to avoid that, you let them automatically deduct money from your paycheck to send to a massive federal bureaucracy to, to buy votes from the poor. It, I just don't think that's the divine economy. I don't think that's what, the, what our Lord was talking about. Otherwise, he would have just gone directly to Pilate and said, listen, levy more taxes and have it distributed to the poor. That'll buy you some votes. It'll help you. It'll help keep the populace happy. It'll help, you know, help you get reelected as governor of Judea. Right. <laughs> Yeah. This is nothing to do with Christianity. Yeah, I don't see that in the Beatitudes at all. <laughs> it might be good. It might be wise public policy. I don't happen to think it is, but that's not the point. The point is you don't need to be the Catholic Church to do all these things. And as Catholics, we don't get any credit right. for doing. For yeah, doing, we, the, the bishop, <laughs> the bishop can't get up and say, look what I did. Yeah. Or look what because the money came from the government. At, on the day of judgment, our Lord's going to say, I was hungry and you taxed someone to collect the money to give me to eat. I was thirsty <laughs> and you collected tax money to build a dam to provide water so that those who could afford to drink could drink. Right. It, it, and so by bureaucratizing it, they have removed the element of Christian charity. They're just right. an adjunct of the federal government, another federal contractor like 
Muslim Family Services or Planned Parenthood or hundreds and thousands of other people who compete. They compete for federal grants because it's profitable. Right. So the bishop, no wonder the bishops are constantly lobbying for more social programs and more federal spending because they get a cut of it. Yeah. That's so, why they're so close to the Democrats, because the Democrats are the ones pushing these programs and they put a veneer of Catholic social teaching over it. It basically is increasingly the, the Bish Catholic Church in America is is a Democratic club with a Catholic problem. Mm. You know, wow, it, it, it's it's Irish and Italian Americans and increasingly Hispanic Americans organized for political purposes who gather for prayer occasionally. They have a prayer meeting in between the political caucuses. Right. Uh, it, it's, and it, we're, we're hurting as a result. We're losing any spiritual emphasis. So how much money are we talking about here? Are we talking about- Hundreds of millions yeah, of dollars. Hundreds of millions. And the last time I checked, the, the Catholic bishops stated their spending on refugees. And do you know how many cents per dollar came from- from Catholics from voluntary donations was not federal money. Three cents. 97 cents of every dollar the bishops spend on refugees is just from the taxpayer. So on the day of judgment, you're going to get a lot of credit for dispersing federal money while creaming some off the top to pay your overhead expenses. Yes. (laughs) But when we see why the bishops are afraid to go after people like Mario, Andrew Cuomo. Right. Because they, they have a huge financial stake in not being removed as the contractor. And the feds could find other contractors to do this. There are people lined up who'd be perfectly happy to fill the role of Catholic Charities and the poor would still get served. None of the poor would suffer. Who would suffer? The bishop's cousin, who's the middle manager, and the bishop's friend, who he made the director of public relations. Right. And, the and, e- and the ex-priest who needs something to do. Exactly. And yeah. when, when the Obama administration was talking about enforcing uh, marriage, so-called marriage equality on Catholic charities as a Catholic, as a federal contractor, Catholic charities fell over itself to say, we have plenty of gay employees. We have, pl- we have directors who are in same-sex marriages. We are proud. We have already in compliance. You, there's nothing, you know, right. <laughs> we're as gay as you could possibly imagine yeah. without actually being bishops. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've only known one person who worked full time for Catholic charities and he was a Muslim, which oh. I, which, you know, yeah, I mean, sir. it just goes to show that the, what is being performed with these funds is not evangelism. Like you've shown it's, it's not charity. And this over time has a negative influence on the people who receive the checks. And that is the bishops. Right. Right. We're, we're, They're we being are conditioned. Catholic, as Southern Methodist University is Methodist. Mm-hmm. It's increasingly just the name that hangs on the building. Like when they talk, when they, when they talk about Jesuit colleges that are, that are just barely discernibly connected to Catholicism, they, they went from saying in the Catholic tradition, now they say in the Jesuit tradition, it, it makes you think of like cheese product, <laughs> cheddar scented cheese, right. cheese like food substance. Right. <laughs> How many layers are removed before we just admit it's an overpriced private school on which you can waste your money, right. which is basically all it amounts to. Right. And, and trying to survive on the fumes of some sort of Catholic uh, prestige. Exactly. It, it, just nostalgia. Yes. Oh, yes. I, you know, the people who remember when places like Fordham and Boston College and Holy Cross were Catholic, those people are increasingly just on life support or, or you know, dying. There's no, you know, they had to be 80 and 90 years old to remember when the Jesuits were a reliable source of Catholic information. Yes. Uh, so that prestige is dying off, but what they have is longstanding relationships with the Democratic Party. Right. And we see that with Cardinal Kupich. Um, when Bishop Paproki, an admirable bishop who's done a lot of good things. He's in, I think, Springfield, Illinois. When he told Dick Durbin that he couldn't receive Holy Communion anymore for supporting one of the more ghoulish late-term Democratic abortion bills, um, a week later, Dick Durbin contact, does a video Skype call with him, thanking Durbin for taking a great stand on immigration. 
So giving him political cover for yep. killing babies because, oh, well, you know, you're filling the pews. And now, now here's the other thing. The bishops get 40 percent of their money from the federal government through, it, through c- contracts for immigrants. What about filling the pews? According to Pew Research, 40 percent of native born Catholics in America leave the church formally. Forty percent say that they that they they've done it officially, not just drifted away, but have left. Imagine if forty percent of General Motors cars blew up. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> if forty percent of the meat at Whole Foods gave you food poisoning. Somebody would get fired. Yes. You know the bishops have found the perfect way to cover it up: bringing in more immigrants, basically stealing souls from Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras. Imagine you're a shepherd and 40 percent of your sheep have been eaten by wolves because you weren't paying attention. And you just go in the neighboring field and steal sheep from there to cover up, fill in the numbers. Right. Does that make you a good shepherd? And no. then are you, are you in any sense? Yeah, I mean, you say, look, we have we have the same numbers we had last year in our in our sheep fold. Right. And so when they say immigrants are the future of the church, what they're saying is American Catholics, we have given up on you. We're going to replace you. Just the way the soldiers in World War One who got sent into no man's land and mowed down by machine guns were replaced with new recruits, new recruits, new recruits. We're going to recruit new people from across the border to fill in the pews to replace you. And of course, the numbers show that a lot of those immigrants leave the church, too. They're human beings. They're Catholics. When they come in and they look around and they see some effeminate nevish spouting gibberish to guitar music up in a, in a hideous butchered sanctuary, they're yes. going to drift away. And a lot of them end up joining evangelical churches where they find spiritual nourishment. And frankly, some they're probably better off than they are in some gay Jesuit parish. I mean, I don't know. Right. It's in God's hands, but at least they are hearing the God, the Bible and they're not, they're not hearing Marx and they're not seeing propaganda for gay active rainbow flags hanging in the, in the sanctuary. Um, and so, who knows what in the, in the, the confessional, Right, right, right. So in, it's I, I called it theological cannon fodder. I just last night saw the movie They Shall Not Grow Old. Beautiful movie about World War One. Peter Jackson, the documentary, did a documentary using old war footage from the Imperial War Museum. But what you see is these young men going into no man's land, 40% of them being wiped out, replaced by fresh recruits, thrown into the front lines, that's what our bishops are doing in the, in the war with secularism. They are just watching souls be ground up in the meat grinder of, of secularism. And their concern is to keep the lights on in their huge administrative buildings and to keep comfortable pensions for people like Theodore McCarrick. Theodore McCarrick, he, he might be reduced to the lay state. He might be laicized. Nobody's talking about he's going to live on a church pension for the rest of his life in right. comfortable housing with church attorneys because they want to keep him away from reporters. Yeah, They don't want him talking about who knew what he was doing to, to, to a teenage boy and to 20-year-old seminarians. or And they certainly don't want him talking about the $25 million, I think it was. First things reported, it was of $25 million that Pope Francis shook down the Papal Foundation for $25 million, had McCarrick do it in order to cover the debts of a corrupt, probably mafia-linked hospital, uh, a Catholic ophthalmology hospital in Rome. You know, because we need Catholic eye hospitals, because Catholic bioethics on the eye are profoundly different, right? (laughs) It's not like a Catholic maternity hospital. Why do you need a Catholic ophthalmological hospital? It just sounds like a boondoggle, and indeed it seems to have been one, and they shook the papal foundation down, for twenty million or twenty-five million dollars, McCarrick was the bag man. Yeah. If he ever talked to a reporter, people might find out more about that. And right. so they're buying his silence by not punishing him for his sins against seminary. So, John, this this kind of raises the question that that I've explored, you know, on this channel and and you've written about at length. And that is, this is not an American problem. It's not just the no. American bishops who are getting. Oh, no. Government funds. This is something going on in the EU. Obviously, the German church is gets all. Doesn't the church in Germany get one hundred percent of its funds? Yeah, cycled in, in, through through the church tax. Here, maybe a, in case some of your viewers don't know, everyone in Germany has to check a box on his tax form: Catholic, Protestant, other, or none. And if you check Catholic, 
at something like eight percent of your income is directly deducted and sent to the bishops. And the bishops don't even spend it themselves. It goes to committees run by laymen, most of them liberal or radical, who actually spend the money. And if you don't check that box, you are ex- excommunicated. Yes. You can't receive communion. You can't get married. You can't be mar- buried in consecrated ground. That is the one thing you can be really be excommunicated for in Germany <laughs> is not paying the church tax. When when they were when Cardinal people were asking if Cardinal Dolan would excommunicate Andrew Cuomo for his infanticide law, I was sure he wouldn't do it. But I said maybe we can prove that. Andrew Cuomo didn't pay the German church tax. Right, right. And that's something we don't mess around with. That will get your butt excommunicated. Yeah. But I mean, how much more could you say your heart is with mammon if then to say, as the German bishops do, they, they, they don't excommunicate anyone for anything except for not it. giving money. And so that makes the church a wing of the government. And no surprise, the German yeah. bishops routinely support the, the EU liberal mainstream politicians and duly denounce any populist conservative parties that threaten their comfortable status quo. There is much a department of the German state as the, the bishops were under the czar in 1914. Yeah. Let's related to all of this is the, the new theology of of being green in the Catholic Church. Oh, right? yeah. Green New Deal. Yeah. Green um, New Deal. Yeah. Pope Francis had Laudato Si. It's definitely part of the UN agenda. It's certainly a part of the leftist agenda. Where, why is that? Because what? it's the perfect vehicle for obliterating subsidiarity and centralizing power in the hands of unelected bureaucrats in Davos, Geneva, Brussels, and New York City at, at the UN. If you can say, the, as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says, that the world is going to end in 12 years unless we act, that's the level of emergency yeah. we're talking about. The house is on fire. We have to stop it. You can't let mere considerations yeah. of democracy or economic growth or letting the poor rise out of poverty, much less property rights, subsidiarity, um, respect for the family. All these things have to go by the wayside because it's a desperate emergency. Yeah. Now, admittedly, 20 years ago, we said global cooling was a desperate emergency. And before that, we said acid rain and the ozone layer and overpopulation were all desperate emergencies. And in every case, strangely enough, our prescription was the same. Give more power to bureaucrats in the federal government and unelected bureaucrats in the world, essentially world government that they're trying to build, but in global agencies, always the same answer. Imagine you went to the doctor and he gave you four or five different terminal diagnoses. You have liver cancer. No, you have AIDS. No, no, you have breast cancer. No, you have Lou Gehrig's disease. But in each case, it's the same medicine, and it's really <laughs> expensive, and you can only buy it there. You might begin to get suspicious about that doctor's integrity. Well, that's where I am with these with these international experts who always seem to find another reason why they and their buddies should have power instead of the people we elect, and why they have to take billions and hundreds of billions of our dollars and redirect them through these these overfunded, bloated agencies to tweak and control and manipulate the people peoples of the world. And they're always in the same direction. Fewer kids in Africa, more gay education and transgender rights in Latin America, more movement of people from the Muslim world to Europe. Always the same. Always the same prescription, always the same bad doctors, Always the same, huge amounts of money flowing from one country into these bureaucratic coffers. The difference with Pope Francis is he's part of that cabal. He is part of the globalist cabal that wants to eliminate national sovereignty. I think Pope Francis, I'm I'm speculating here. I have not interviewed the man. I did edit his first book in English. My publisher, Crossroad, got hold of his first. As soon as he was elected, they got a book of his sermons that had been tra- and they translated it. And I was the editor, but I don't I don't claim any great expertise. 
But it seems to me that Pope Francis is one of those Argentines who deeply resents the United States. Argentina Obviously. was as rich as the United States back in 1910. We were equally rich per capita. Okay, we're both pioneer countries with mostly European immigrants who came in and started farms and ranches. There were very parallel developments between the U.S. and Argentina until 1910. And then they started adopting left-wing populism. They started crony capitalism, crony socialism, um, all the things that, that drove Argentina into the status of a third world country. Some Argentines responded to that by saying, you know, we need to repent. This was terrible. We, we ruined our country. A lot of others scapegoat the United States because we didn't make the same mistakes on the same scale as they did. We did not run ourselves into the ground. So they resent us. We are Yankee devils. And I'm sorry, I think that's where Pope Francis comes from. I think he, he is a, an embittered Argentine nationalist who resents America and, and has in, 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 imbued enough leftist ideology that he actually resents the middle class, the existence of an independent middle class, and uh, wants to see these things kind of overwhelmed by massive numbers of poor people emigrating into the country uh, and overwhelming the political independence and, you know, the cultural cohesion of those peoples. Because he, I don't see the Pope demanding mass immigration into North Korea or into China. It's, it's always Western countries that have to accept immigrants. And he, he contradicts the exact text of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I'm waiting for a Catholic bishop to acknowledge the official teaching of the Catholic Church is that a country can and should regulate immigration for the sake of the common good of its native citizens. Yes. And that immigrants have to obey the laws of the country that they enter. If they don't, it's not Catholic. Their duties, they lose their rights. No, but if you, it, it, the, the way the catechism sets it up, countries should try to welcome people in search of a better life. In return, they have to pay taxes, obey the law, and be grateful and respectful towards the culture of the country that accepted them. If they don't fulfill their duties, they lose their right to be there. That's how it works. You have rights and duties that go together. If you don't fulfill your duties, you lose your rights. Like if you don't show up for work, you lose your paycheck, okay? So by the very terms of the catechism, anyone who has entered the United States illegally has not obeyed the law as the catechism says he must. And so from the Catholic perspective, it would be perfectly just to deport every single person who came here illegally. I'm not saying it's a great idea. I'm not saying it would be prudent. That's up to politicians. But from a point of view of moral theology, according to the catechism, just reading the words, it would be perfectly just to remove everyone who has entered a country illegally because they've violated the first duty they have towards a host country, which is to obey the law. Right, right. You know, John, what's in common with the, both these issues of immigration and the green, you know, say. Well, the, let's go into the specifics. Yeah, but, but the, the commonality for both of these is, is they both knock up against national sovereignty and borders. Right. right. So they are they are de facto globalists. They are de facto new world order. They are de, de facto United Nations. And right. it breaks my heart to see the Catholic Church on board with the wrong team, the bad guys. And even the Pope himself is on the bad team. Oh, yeah. Now, it, it's interesting. Part of it, okay, there's a fascinating book called The, the Virtue of Nationalism by Yoram Hazoni, an Israeli political scientist. Highly recommended. And he talks about nationalism and he points out that there is a temptation in Catholic circles towards globalism because we have one church. It, we, there's a temptation to think there should be one state. There should be one, the Holy Roman Empire should cover the whole earth and you have one pope and one emperor. Um, remember that our political you know, ideas were formed as part of the Roman Empire under Constantine. So part of our heritage is that imperial heritage. And, and we're, even Pope Benedict, unfortunately, in, in his uh, Caritate and Veritate, I think it is. Yep. Um, he, he called for the establishment of a global political authority. I know. When I, when I read that, that was sort of my first red pill on Benedict. I, okay. I was a new Catholic, and I read that, and I thought, man, that doesn't sound good. Benedict well, saying that? Yeah. 
the idea, do you know what a, a single world state would be? It would be a, a dystopia where, from which there is no escape except to the moon or outer space. There's no exile. There's no escape. It, it, that's why every tyrant, every ideological maniac has dreamed of uniting the world under his control so that there is no place to escape. There's nowhere dissidents can go to hide. So, no, one global authority is a terrible idea. Pope Benedict did it in a very measured way, and he said, of course, it would have to respect subsidiarity, to which the answer is, of course, it wouldn't respect subsidiarity. <laughs> of course, it would crush everything under it in its wake, and it, it, it would be a leviathan, a juggernaut crushing everything before it. But what we have to support nationalism because it's a break against globalists who are trying to monopolize power and who are not responsible to anyone and who are not answerable and not accountable. I'm not saying nationalism is the best thing in the world, maybe localism or tribalism. There are, uh, there are different levels of political organization and the nation state is not some eternal thing dropped by God, but, it, but God did create the nation of the Jews, right? I mean, his covenant was with a people, was with a nation. It was not with the whole world. It was not with one tiny tribe. It was not with an empire. It was with a people that were a nation. And that's why this book, The Virtue of Nationalism by an Israeli political thinker is particularly interesting. And why I think the, the, the best elements in the church today are aligning with populists and nationalists. That, and we don't wanna be completely overwhelmed by the Muslim hordes. That's a perennial thing for Catholics keeping out the Muslim hordes. My family's Croatian. We fought along the frontier of the Austrian Empire keeping out the Muslim horde. Anyone who wants to invite in the Muslim hordes is not my friend. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you had mentioned um, Ocasio-Cortez. Oh, what a precious, special so little person she is. Alexandria, she has a special idea that she's recently made popular. Uh, and you, you had a good article on it. I read it yesterday. Uh, right. On the uh, the Green New Deal that that she, well, I guess she said she accidentally leaked it. I and mean, what's the story on this? <laughs> okay, all right. The article was the Green New Deal, Catholic Marxists, and those unwilling to work. Um, the ch sequence of events is she they created this uh, this vague series of proposals that they put as a House resolution. Then she fleshed it out what it would mean in a very detailed FAQ that was up on her website. They sent it to NPR, they were so proud of it. NPR invited them on and she defended it and talked about how great it was. Then every sane person in America started making fun of it because it included getting rid of all meat eating and getting rid of all cows because their farts destroy <laughs> the, uh, the climate, their, their carbon, the, the methane from cow farts is destroying the planet. Uh, getting rid of all air travel and crisscrossing the country with bullet trains. We can't even run a train from San Francisco to California through the most densely populous you know, state, the, the biggest collection of big cities. We can't even manage to connect San Francisco with Los Angeles, but she wants to connect Wyoming to Florida and get rid of, get rid of air right. travel, renovate every building in America so that it's green. Everyone, and, and every or, or tear them down. That's, that's right, and rebuild them, that'll be lots of jobs. Uh, and get rid of all fossil fuels and all nuclear fuels, okay? And I'm not sure what alternative energy, we can't even burn the cow farts because the cows will be dead. Yeah. But everything will be wind farms and volcanoes and, and uh, dams, but of course dams hurt the fish. There literally is no way to produce the level of energy that the United States uses if you got rid of all the fossil fuels and all the nuclear fuels and the natural gas. It's total insanity. But my favorite is that she wanted to promise economic security to those who are unable or unwilling to work. Right. And that's my favorite special thing. And that's where the Catholic left comes in. Um, I was looking on Twitter. I follow Mickey Kaus and he he had someone on his thread point out that the unwilling to work clause that was in her official plan seems to be have come courtesy of Matt Brunig. Matt Brunig is a big left wing blogger who's married to Elizabeth Brunig, who is the, I think, opinion editor at the, at the Washington Post. 
And she calls herself a Catholic Marxist. A Catholic Marxist, and I've got that in the article. Uh, the picture of her saying that on Twitter. So her, apparently Matt Brunig is very influential in the circles that drew up the Green New Deal. And he said, well, if you force people to receive, to work in order to get their money from the government, that amounts to workfare. That's unjust. And th that <laughs> sounds kind of crazy to us, right? I mean, right. In, in Thessalonians, two Thessalonians, Paul wrote, if he does not work, shall not eat. But the Catholic left doesn't believe that. No. There was something that came out a few years ago called the Tratonista Manifesto. It was, it was drawn up by people who fancied themselves Orthodox Catholics. They claimed to support Orthodox Catholic teaching on sexual morality, for instance. That seems to be the limits test. Like, right. you, can be, you can be a Stalinist, but if you say you're against birth control, okay, well, you're, you're part of the team. Right. You, know, you may be an atheist, but, but, but you're fundamentally right. Well, so they say they're Orthodox on Catholic sexual morality. What they want is a global Marxist state with open borders and a guaranteed income for everyone, even if they're unwilling to work. They put it in black and white. So I kind of see, can see the origin of this. They, they think that something in Catholic social teaching says you're entitled to health care, housing, food, water, and education. And if you want to work, that's great because it because work is good for you. But, but you, we, we're not going to make your rights as a human being conditional on what you're willing to do to serve other people. Right. It's absolute fantasy, delusion, and madness. But of course, when socialism is actually put into effect, people who don't, who are unwilling to work get sent to gulags or left to starve or shot in the back of the head. The, the, the or, 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 or John, you, you have people who maybe aren't willing to work in the strict sense, but maybe they're, they have their, they're a farmer in communist Russia and they right. just don't work as hard. Yeah. They yeah. work half as hard. And so production goes down by half in the entire, na and if right. everyone in the nation does that, cause you get paid the same, whether you work hard and you're an entrepreneur or whether you'd hardly lift a shovel. Right. So, right. so national production goes down. Everyone gets poor. Yeah. Well, look in Venezuela. Yeah. The land without toilet paper, mm -hmm. Venezuela, the land where, Hungry people were breaking into the national zoo to get the half-starved animals, kill them and eat them. That's socialism. Yeah. Socialism is you go to the zoo to eat the dying, starved ostriches. And mm. the fact that there are American politicians promoting socialism, even as Venezuela starves and falls apart in this horrendous tragedy right before our eyes, it, it's just staggering to me. It, it, it shows you the power of ideology to overwhelm even the evidence of the senses, much less the arguments of reason. And it's not just the American politician. It's the cardinal and the pope. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the pope's economic statement, they're absolutely delusional. They're completely yeah. unhinged from reality. But one thing I have to be grateful for, this pope has helped me see the limitations of papal authority. Mm -hmm. No longer yeah. will I ever think... That just because the Pope says something, well, it's probably infallible or maybe kind of infallible. No, no, I'm going right. to judge it entirely on its merits. Unless he says ex cathedra, right. I'm going to judge it 100% on its merits. Right. That's kind of liberating, actually. It is. And, and, and this might be the, the doctrinal clarification that we've needed. It's a very painful remedy. But, uh, yes. John, I think everybody that I know who is a practicing Catholic who's going to Mass every Sunday on the Holy Day of Obligations, we're all having that same uh, same realization that yeah. when the Pope's on an airplane, he's not any more infallible than me or you. And he's just a Pope he, on an airplane. Yeah. it's out, well, the, the metaphor I use is uh, Clarence Thomas. Very smart man. I love the guy. But when he talks about the Constitution— it doesn't make law. It doesn't make binding precedent. Only when he writes for the majority on the court in an official decision, which is 1.1111% of, of everything said by Clarence Thomas, even about the law or the Constitution, yes. is not binding constitutional jurisprudence. Likewise, the 0.001% of papal statements that even could have been considered infallible is trivial compared to the sheer vast quantity of what they say that is not infallible. No, it might be correct, 
Pius sure. the Twelfth was brilliant. I have this book, The Pope Speaks, of his allocutions. What a learned and wise man coming out of a coherent intellectual tradition. So yes, we should usually listen to the popes because they're usually intelligent and holy and they come from a coherent intellectual tradition. Yeah. In this case, we should listen to the Pope to see what the New York Times is going to be shoving down our throat next week and to be prepared to analyze it in light of the official teachings of the catechism. I mean, the Pope has already changed the catechism on the death penalty. How can something that Pope Pius XII said was absolutely legitimate, he, he called the state the legitimate avenger of crimes, quoting the, counts, the, the right. catechism of the Council of Trent. He demanded that the Nazi war criminals be, be hanged and said they should be hanged more quickly, that the Allies were taking too long to hang the Nazis. How can society have changed so much in the past 50 years that now the death penalty is wrong? And by the way, not a lot of people talk about this. Pope Francis thinks life imprisonment is unjust. That's right. And what's his reason for that? It deprives people of the virtue of hope. No, it doesn't. Hope refers to eternal salvation, not to getting out of jail. Yes. The, the sh oh, I'm sorry. And it, it's not just feel like I'm it, taking crazy pills. Yes, it's like Zoolander. we're taking crazy pills. I can do that. <laughs> it's getting deep. I mean, the it's not just that a catechism changed. It's that people now say doctrine has changed. Right. Something on it, faith and morals, which is the death penalty has changed. It, it went from, like you said, with Pius XII, to now it is inadmissible. Right. Which, by the way, what the hell does that mean? Inadmissible is not a term in theology. Right. Yeah. But, but it's a term in law. It's not a right. term in theology, but it's a weasel word. One of the post ways of changing doctrine in people's eyes, but leaving enough of a loophole so that people can't say, well, you're now a formal heretic. Correct. You're just so, a material heretic. So speaking of weasel words and, and weaponized ambiguity, uh, what's your take on Pope Francis's statement that God wills the plurality and diversity of religions? Oh, I've got a piece on, on this extreme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wrote, you wrote a good uh, article on that. Thanks. Does God, did, God, does, did Pope Francis say that God willed Islam into existence? Um, yeah, there, this is a, a, a political document that was produced for, uh, for the United Arab Emirates for the Pope's visit there. And it's a declaration on human rights and tolerance uh, that's signed by him and <clears throat> this imam from Al-Azhar University in Egypt, which is the most important, prominent Muslim university. And what, it says a lot of nice things, the things that, that sound good about not persecuting minorities and ethnic diversity being a good thing. A lot of unexceptionable language that kind of reads like Gaudium et Spes. Um, but right in the middle of it, it says, God will there to be a plurality of religions. Now, religions, are, races, sexes, yeah, languages, I'll, I'll, but religions I'll, is in there. Yeah, yeah. He talks about races and cultures and ethnic groups. Fine, okay. I'm not going to argue about the Tower of Babel. It's not that important. I believe God will there be a, a diversity of races, okay? But religions? You know who doesn't believe that God wills for there to be multiple religions? Just two groups: Muslims and Catholics. Jews believe that. Jews believe that they're called to be Jews, but other people are not, and they're Gentiles, and they don't let God bless them and keep them. It's fine, okay? That is a Jewish attitude. They don't try to convert people. They don't think they're, they're called to get other people to become Jew. But Muslims do, and Catholics do. Right. We each believe that our religion is true and that the other religion is false. We believe that Islam is especially, is particularly false. It is a post-Christian heresy. It is an invention. Right. It's a combination of Gnostic fables about the life of Christ, docetist theories, a mishmash. I'm, I mean, I've read a lot about this, about the likely origins of Islam. It, it, it emerged from an Arab culture that had a kind of a, a vague, cloudy version, notion of both Jewish and Christian Origin, you know, stories, and it created an origins myth. It's a totally different religion that says that Jesus was just a human being, and that he will come back at the end of time, 
to kill all the Christians and break all the crosses, to punish them for idolatrously worshiping him as God instead of man. In fact, he wasn't even crucified. An imposter was crucified instead of him. Um, but yeah, he's just a prophet who came to pr prepare the way for Muhammad. It's heresy. It's horrible. Yeah. And they believe that we are polytheists who worship a man and will be burn in the eternal fires for worshiping a man instead of God. And, and, we, also, and we worship idols, they also say. Right? Well, they think that they think that we the Trinity consists of Jesus, God, and Mary. Yeah. It they, says they in the Quran. That, it's in the Quran. Yeah, they didn't even get that right. So these religions, we don't have to kill each other, okay? I think peaceful coexistence, preferably across huge bodies of water like the Mediterranean, is possible. Peaceful coexistence in America is possible and is necessary. But to say that God wanted both religions to exist, what, does, what would that mean theologically? That there's a, a multi-track route to getting to heaven? If there are multiple ways to get to heaven, if, if any religion can save you, we're in the wrong one. This one is a pain in the neck. I think if being a liberal Jew going to synagogue twice a year and giving money to the Democratic Party, if that's an equal road to heaven, I'm going to take that one. Right. It's a lot easier. Well, it's more than that. It's more than that. If all of them get you to heaven, ours is especially pernicious because ours entails the son of God suffering a horrible death for our redemption. Right. Why would right. that be? I mean, that's, it makes ours almost blasphemous, you know, that, you know, you can, you know, fast some and, and meditate. Um, but, you know, like a Buddhist, but, or you can have, you follow the crucified savior and you yourself, like you said, like pain and neck to do penance, right? Right. Repent, yeah. do penance. I think the orthodox attitude is to say other religions are obstacles to salvation. They might not be permanent, fatal obstacles. God might save people who are invincibly ignorant. God, you know, offers baptism of desire. I don't know the mystery of who is saved, but I know how one is saved. And I know that being a Muslim doesn't help you get saved. No, you it can only be saved, Jesus, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. So you must go through Jesus. It's the only way to the Father. And the body of Christ is the church. So you can only right. be saved in the church through Jesus Christ. Now, like you mentioned, there are ways to be incorporated by a desire for baptism. But again, this is way beyond our human knowledge. That's right. Objectively speaking, if you say, how do you get to heaven? You say, well, you've got original sin, venial sins, moral sins. The only way to get rid of those is Jesus Christ. And that will bring you to the Father. Objectively speaking, right. that's the only way. Right. It's like we know that vaccines protect against certain diseases. Somebody says, well, you know, I heard this herbal supplement my, my well, that's not what I want the doctor dispensing. I don't want right. peppermint oil. No, I asked for a measles vaccine, not peppermint oil. Yeah. But it might work. You know what? That's not responsible. Yeah. Yeah. So the Pope said, signed a document saying that God had willed the existence of many religions, including Islam. The Muslim did sign the same thing. The Muslim doesn't believe it. He has actually said elsewhere in Arabic, but some helpful Israeli people translated it, that Muslims who become Christians should be executed, as it says in the Quran. He supports that. Yeah. Okay. So when he's not meeting with the Pope to sign documents that sound like they were drawn up by the Freemasons, uh, he is yeah, advocating the execution of Muslim apostates. Uh, so he doesn't believe that. The Pope, I don't know if the Pope believes that. Uh, or quite what he believes, Father Zulsdorf, who's a very sharp critic of the Pope sometimes, but I think in this case, he was trying a little too hard to show filial piety. He said, we must try to understand this in an orthodox sense, if at all possible. And so it is possible to look at what the Pope said and remember that the permissive will of God exists too. So in the sense that God permitted the fall of man and the Holocaust and the Ukrainian famine and Pol Pot, he permitted the rise of Islam. Now, is that a 
if that's what the Pope meant, if that's what the Pope meant, then he was consciously trying to deceive the Muslims who read the document. That's so right. he's disgustingly Jesuitical, yes. practicing actually the Muslim practice of taqiyya, of strategic deception. If yeah. that's what he meant, then that's dis- disgusting, and I'm offended on behalf of Muslims. If it's not what he meant, then he is a formal heretic reigning as Pope. Yeah. Pick one. The, and he also says in that statement that it's willed by the wise divine will. And then the next part is with which he created human beings. Maybe that's the permissive will of God. No, but too. no, no, no. But yeah, <laughs> God didn't permissively <laughs> will humans. He actively willed I, the creation of humans. So there's, there is, I appreciate what Father Z is doing there. And it, it shows some filial, filial piety towards the Holy Father, but it grammatically, and in a couple, and earlier this week we did a show and, and we looked at the Italian, we looked at the Spanish, we looked at the English, and in none of these languages can you rescue the theology. Yeah. It's bad theology. God did not will that people worship Baal. God did yeah. not worship, God did not will that people um, would deny the Trinity and deny that his son is the son of God. He didn't will any of that. Find the Jim Jones cult in Vienna. He didn't will that people would be Satanists because that's a religion. Yeah. Yeah. Scientology. Uh, Yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Hare Krishnas. God didn't positively will any of that. And to say so is wrong. Now, you said the word formal heresy there. I always want to back off on that because, you know, the Pope is judged by no one. I think I just when it comes to the formal H word, I just don't know as as well, think, subjects think, of the Pope, if we can say that, because to be a formal heretic, you have to be canonically tried. No, you have to have been admonished. You have to admonished to, and then but, tried. You ha- well, I'm not saying I'm not passing a judgment of him, but all right, material heresy is basically oops heresy. Right. You accidentally believe something that turns out not to be the church's teaching. Yeah. Formal heresy is. You you've been you've seen the evidence. You've been shown yeah. the evidence that the church teaches X and you say Y. OK, Pope Francis knows the church teaches X and he is saying Y. So he fits the qualifications for a formal heretic. I don't have the authority to try him. I right. wish we had a Holy Roman Emperor who could arrest him and depose him as emperors did in the past. of really a, 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 appalling popes on a couple of occasions. The Emperor Otto the Great saved the papacy in the ninth century, the papacy was under the control of Roman prostitutes, these powerful Roman courtesans yep. who were appointing their boyfriends and their sons as popes. It yes. was called pornocracy or the reign of whores. And Pope Otto marched in and forced the pope to resign and held a new papal election and cleaned the whole thing up. We don't have a temporal authority who could do that now, tragically. Um, so I don't, I don't see how this gets fixed short of like a meteorite hitting, hitting the right building at the right time. I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, the <laughs> next the, the next conclave is stacked yeah. with it's almost it's almost 50. I don't know what the number is exactly right now, but I believe it's almost 50 percent are Francis appointees. Yeah. To the call of the Cardinals. By by Cardinal Farrell. Yeah. That littering idiot. who used to be Bishop of Dallas. I used to read his pastoral letters aloud and make fun of the logical fallacies and the grammatical errors. He's just dumb. And, and he was the ex-roommate. He was the roommate with McCarrick. Yeah, and he claimed he didn't know anything was going on. And before I that, guess. he was the driver for Maciel Maciel, and he didn't know anything was going on. <laughs> I thought they were just playing horsey. I don't yeah. know. What, I just, just don't know what's going on. Give me more money. Yeah. It, it's, it's appalling. I mean, I, I even came up with a scheme. Maybe the Italian government, should use the sex abuse crisis as a pretext to ban certain cardinals from the country and keep them out of the next conflict. I mean, I can't think of a way to fix this except for like the, the Caesar to step in and say, no, I'm sorry, you, you people are unsafe for the children of Italy. We're not letting you into the country for the conflict. I, I just don't know how it gets fixed. Well, do you think, do you, th- some people have suggested that Islam will step in and, and just persecute Rome horribly. Well, I'm just talking about the next papal election. Well, I'm not so am I. I mean, yeah. I mean, the Muslims want to attack Europe. They want to attack. I mean, Rome has always been one of their crown jewels. They'd love to get Rome. I mean, yeah. do we see? Because the last several summers I've been in Rome, every single time they've increased security at 
at the churches. Saint, I was r- even jogging one morning through St. Peter's Square and the car pulled up with the alarm. This is two years ago. It says, you can't jog here this morning. I'm like, why is it security? So I think they're aware of, of, of security problems. And I don't know. I, I, I fear the worst. I Because fe- I know I read the Bible. I read scripture. And when the priests of God and the people of God turn away and are not faithful, they are handed over. And it's never a pretty thing. And I, I, it's not like this has just been happening for two years. This has been happening for decades in the church. And so I fear the worst. One thing that Pope Francis has helped us to see is that there was not some great restoration under Benedict or under John Paul II. They, they appointed whoever the local, their local people told them were good. They believed their sources on the ground. And so we got hacks like Whirl, uh, perverts like McCarrick, idiots like Farrell, and now we get simpletons like Kupich and Tobin. I mean, these people are not suited to be managers at Piggly Wiggly, maybe assistant managers. I I feel like we've got the most mediocre, effeminate, lazy bunch. It's it's staggering, and, and and it's profoundly dispiriting. And I'm glad I'm in my 50s, not in my 20s. And I'm not married. I don't have any kids, so I'm not leaving any hostages behind. So right. not me. I, I worry about it all the time. I think, man, what's going to happen to my kids, my grandkids? Are we going to have to migrate to some other? And I, you know, I'm in Texas, but I mean, are we going to yeah. have to migrate and find a new, be pilgrims and find a new world? There could be a last stand in Texas. I think. I mean, in terms of secular politics, it's crazy how the left is escalating and constantly. Mm pushing towards violence and threatening people and calling for physical confrontations. They seem like they want to start a Spanish civil war here in America, which I'd like to remind them how that one turned out. Right. Who won? And you've got effeminate, weak vegetarians who live in their mother's basements, who've never held a gun and don't believe in an afterlife. Right. Threatening civil strife against Christian gun owners who believe that they're saved and have been hunting since they were small kids. How long is that going to last? That'll be the shortest civil war in history. <laughs> These people really should back off on the rhetoric of violence and confrontation. It will not end well for them. It will not be pretty. And we will make them build our Valley of the Fallen, like the one they built in Spain. But I think we'll do it in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> Branson, that would be Missouri. Right. I love it. Valley I love it. That the leftist political prisoners, after the civil war they start, ends in 72 hours. We will make them build an enormous mega church. It can have a Catholic Latin mass chapel in the back, but it'll be like <laughs> a big Protestant mega church because they'll do most of the fighting. And it yep. can be in France and we can go on pilgrimages there. You know, that's yep. that's my optimistic scenario. That's the message of hope for the people. <laughs> the message of hope. The springtime. Um <laughs> I think yeah, we, so, right. so, so what I'm, I'm hearing from you, uh, of course, there's always hope and hope, hope is supernatural. Like our end game yeah. is ultimately to not die in a state of mortal sin and to go to heaven and be with our Lord Jesus. So we all grant that. But from what I'm hearing from you, from a, a political point of view and then an ecclesial point of view and a papal point of view, we're not going to see any reform in the next decade, two decades. Three decades. I, I don't expect to see anything good happen in the Catholic ch- visible church for the rest of my life. So I expect to die and have watch things continue down down this trajectory. Mm-hmm. Because I don't see short of a, a meteorite hitting the conclave and there were four or five Africans who missed their connecting flights. <laughs> right. I don't see how we ever right. get and, and Burke was in Cardinal Burke was in the hospital and wasn't there. That, that's yeah. right. That's right. But you know, God controls the meteorites though. I mean, if we if what we want is a meteorite, he is the only source of them. And that would be his active will, I think, not his permissive will. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, so I, you know, I'm focusing on the things that I can I can try to do, which is like close the American border so that one state doesn't turn blue after another. Um, we're very close to the tipping point where no pro-life president will ever be elected again. No, no president who wants to protect the Second Amendment or freedom of speech or freedom of religion. We're very close to just a lock-in in the Electoral College and the already in the popular vote, the Democrats have it, 
of candidates like Kamala Harris and and Ocasio-Cortez, very dangerous people who don't respect any of our most fundamental freedoms. Do you think Ocasio-Cortez has a future? I mean, she seems to me to be like the new, as we had down here in Texas, the, you know, Beto. Everybody was hyped up on him and now he's sort of disgraced and he's, you know, not much about him. She kind of seems the same way. I, I just can't take her seriously. Uh, well, nobody took Trump seriously either. Yeah. Yeah. He he he, he surprised us. And the, I think she's going to surprise us. I think Kamala Harris is profoundly dangerous. She's a fascist. Mm. She wants to imprison journalists. She's a monster. Mm-hmm. But I think she's got such a nasty edge about her that she will alienate people. Uh, Cortez, it's hard to hate her. It's like hating a puppy. Whatever the puppy did, wherever the puppy peed, when he looks at you with those big, dumb brown eyes and shows you those white, goofy teeth, you really can't hate him. She has that quality about her. And that goes along with yeah, it. But do you want a puppy to be your leader? We, I we don't. Just, yeah, I know. But we just elected a guy... And I support him. But in his primary campaign, he accused Ted Cruz's dad of uh, helping knock off JFK. I mean, he was pretty fast and loose with the, with the truth. He, we, there is a video of him shaving Vince McMahon's head in a wrestling ring. OK, <laughs> the old norms are gone. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Things, things have gotten pretty crazy. So, I mean, all the, the rule books are out. <laughs> yeah. So do you think they're going to bring up Ocasio-Cortez as the, their candidate? No, 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 no. I don't think she's a near term presidential candidate. I'm using her as an example of the kind of demagogic left wing populism that appeals to very poorly educated young people. I see. Who usually don't vote. But if you convince them it's cool and you offer them a free Frappuccino, they'll show up and vote. And precisely the kind of people who should not be voting, right. you know, we should make it difficult to vote. It should be like, OK, you can vote, but it means you're going to get jury duty. There is a price here. Mm. I mean, a lot of people would give up their vote if it meant they didn't have to do jury duty. Yeah. We should just make that clear. Hey, get out of jury de- duty free. You just don't vote. If you don't care about voting enough to do jury duty, you shouldn't be voting. And that would be great. We need fewer. Yeah, people. I mean, it, it it entails patriotism. It entails service and sacrifice to the least degree. Which we're not yes. asking e- even to join the military at eighteen. We're asking you to serve right. jury duty. Yeah, yeah. To help bring justice to the land. Now I'm lucky that my father had the same exact name as I did, and when he died, New York thought I thought John Zmerak is dead, and never and never asked me to do jury duty. <laughs> So I've never had to do jury duty, 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 duty about that. because as far as the government is concerned, John Zmira. Someone in the government just watched this video and said, oh, put him on the rolls. That's fine. They, the defense lawyer will Google my name and they That's will right. send me home immediately. Being a writer or <laughs> they don't want me on the jury. I don't have to dress up as Princess Leia like like uh, on 30 Rock. Right. <laughs> Lemon dresses as Princess Leia to try to get out of jury duty. <laughs> yeah. But it's New York City, so she's not weird enough. She fits right in with all the right. other weirdos, so she has to do the trial. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I hope people will check out some of my books. That the yeah, let's talk. Guide. So uh, Politically Incorrect Guide to Catholicism, what's that about? That is, it's, it's half an explanation and apologetic in defense of the church and its history, her, her history and her teachings. And half an analysis of the hot button issues where the church ventures into or gets dragged into politics. Uh, and especially where Pope Francis has boldly charged in. So I talk about science and climate change, gun control and capital punishment, immigration, the economy, uh, global warming. I think I mentioned that, uh, all the issues where the church has been politicized mostly by the left. And I go in the church documents, church theology, tradition, catechisms, books, to explain why you don't have to follow the official line put out by Jesuit theologians and the bishops' conference and sometimes the Vatican, 
which always seems to lean in one political direction, yep. the direction that happens to be providing hundreds of millions of dollars to the bishops. But that's totally a coincidence. Yeah. That is 100 percent a coincidence. <laughs> yep. 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 So, and then the the uh, Bad Catholic's Guide to the Seven Deadly Sins. It's my favorite book that I've written. It's part of a series that I did, The Bad Catholic's Guide. This one is an I go through the seven deadly sins in a way that very few people do. Most people think there's a deadly sin and then there's the opposing virtue. But in fact, that's not it. The deadly sin is here. The, the opposite of it is another sin, an opposite sin. And the virtue is the golden mean between them. Right. That's Aquinas. Yeah, very Thomistic. For him, that's Aristotle, the Nicomachean Ethics. But most people aren't taught that. They don't think in those, those terms. So as a result, they think, well, what's the opposite of sinful wrath? Oh, that's the virtue of patience. No, patience is in the middle. At the opposite of sinful wrath is sinful servility, where you're a disgusting doormat and you enable and encourage sociopaths to take advantage of you and the next guy. Yes. The yes. opposite of the opposite of vainglory, or you know, pride, pride. vainglory. The opposite of that is not humility. Humility is an honest assessment of your virtues and a gratitude to God for giving them to you. The opposite of humility is scrupulosity, where your sins and your faults weigh you down so much that you're tempted to despair like Judas. So, so much of the craziness I've seen in Christian, but especially Catholic subculture circles, it, it was produced by people looking at the deadly sin and thinking, if I do the exact opposite, I'll be fine. So you get people who, who are, you know, scrupulous, so yeah. scrupulous, uh, insensible. I mean, I have the list of the seven deadly neuroses and they're mm -hmm. just as bad as the seven <laughs> deadly sins. And the best way to read it, it, it's the fun thing to look is at Dante in this. There's one circle. You have the greedy and the prodigal, the wasteful mm. Air are the opposite sins. Yeah. And so he has them interacting in hell because Dante was a Thomist. Yeah. So I was inspired by my reading of Dante studying in graduate school to do a humorous look at the seven deadly sins. And I have quizzes at the end of every chapter to see if you are in the grip of the deadly sin or the opposite bite, the opposite sin, or if you're coming close to the golden mean. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well done. Yeah. Good. I'm going to get that one. I'm getting that one. Let me know what you think. All right. I will. Maybe we'll have you back on. We'll talk about it. Okay, that would be great. Yep. Thanks. So, all right. Well, Dr. John Zmirag, this has been really great. I just want to encourage everybody to like and subscribe to this video. Hit the bell. You'll be notified for future videos. And as I always say, have hope. Don't be discouraged. You know, all this stuff about bishops and money and corruption and error. That is not something that can block you or is an obstacle of getting to heaven or being saved or even having joy in this life. So look to Christ. Be Catholic, live your vocation, pray the rosary, and um, God bless until the next video. Thanks. All right. Has anyone ever asked you to explain a Catholic topic and stumped you? St. Peter, our first Pope, once wrote this. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. The problem is it takes years and even decades to study sacred scripture, the church fathers, magisterial documents, and councils. Most of us don't have that much time, even if we wanted to. So what if there were a way to have all of these answers prepared for us, literally at our fingertips? My name is Dr. Taylor Marshall. I'm the founder of the New St. Thomas Institute, and we have created an online library of video and audio resources answering the most common objections against our Catholic faith. As a student member of the New St. Thomas Institute, you'll have access to our short and informative lessons by searching for the topics that interest you. For example, how to explain the Crusades, how to answer the top 10 atheist objections, how to answer Mormons when they come to your front door, and how to easily and quickly explain the Eucharist, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the papacy, the sacraments, and much more. You could easily spend thousands of dollars taking classes at universities or seminaries, but our tuition is the most affordable on earth. Plus, you'll have free access to our popular certificates in Catholic philosophy, Catholic theology, Catholic apologetics, church history, and New Testament studies. So if you're struggling with a topic and you need help, we have resources and answers waiting for you. 
take your faith to the next level, become confident in your Catholic faith, join the new St. Thomas Institute today.